welcome to each one of you, a warm welcome, as another broadcast of the Voice of Truth program comes your way. And I am your host, Paul Fry. I do extend to each of you not only a warm welcome, but greetings. Greetings in that precious name that I love, that name which is above every name, the name of the Lord of heaven and earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. We bring you greetings in his precious name. You know the Bible has much to say about the human heart in its unconverted state. In <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 9.3 it says, The heart of the children of men is full of evil. And the, the heart in its folly is throughout life. Again, in Ecclesiastes 11, verse 8, it's 8, verse 11, it says these words. When God does not execute a sentence immediately upon some evil work, it says, therefore, the heart of man is fully set to do evil. Again, in Jeremiah 17, 9, the Bible says that the heart, the unconverted heart, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then in Mark chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, listen to what the Lord has to say about the unconverted heart. For he says, From within, out of the heart, proceed, now listen to the following, evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, that means with no moral restraint, and then the evil eye, now these last three, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. That's what the Lord says comes out of the unconverted heart. And that word blasphemy I'd like to pay special attention to because it really implies what this message will be all about today. That word means to vilify, to defame. And <clears throat> as I said, it's very prominent in our text, which is found in Zephaniah, a little book in the Old Testament, verse 12. And the background for this is that the people of Judah were caught up in idolatry. Not only were they caught up in idolatry, but then they tried to tie the worship of their idolatry to the worship of the true God, Jehovah. It's like today when the church will uh, take that things which imitates the world and try to tie it in to the worship of God. And then it speaks about apostasy. What is apostasy? Turning back. And that's what it says in verse 6, they turned back from God. And then also in that verse, it says they did not seek after God. In other words, they were content with their religious activity, content to give lift serv service, but not from the heart. And so we find then that God speaking through the prophet Zephaniah, and he prophesied about 30 years before uh, Judah would be taken into captivity, when Jerusalem would be destroyed. They're about 587 B.C. He prophesied about 30 years before this event. And so, I would like to now, as I turn to the book of Zephaniah, I'd like to read uh, how God begins His <clears throat> word to Judah through His prophet Zephaniah, verses 2 and 3. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks, idols with the wicked and will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. So we have here a picture of terrible judgment that would come. But you know, those words are very similar to the words found in Genesis 6 and verse 7 
when the Lord said that He would destroy the earth by a flood. And then again at the end, uh, almost at the end of the Bible in Second Peter uh, chapter 3, listen to these words, what awaits this world, this earth. It says, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word, the same word that kept the uh, judgment of waters off the face of the earth until Noah was in the ark with his family. It says, the same word are kept in store, reserved onto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. That's what awaits this world. The world did or was judged by a flood in Noah's day. And what awaits this world is judgment by fire. And now from verses 4 to 11, he speaks uh, now about the wickedness of Judah. I already told you uh, their sins, some of their sins, and that he, and judgment uh, in a local sense was coming upon them before they're being delivered into captivity in Babylon. And this all comes up to the text for today. Verse 12, <clears throat> it says, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good neither will he do evil. That word there has the idea of calamity, bringing calamity or judgment upon the people. And from that verse, <clears throat> and the background I've already stated, I'd like to share three things, which will come under the heading of the title of this message, The Folly of Mocking God. First, the arrogance and contempt of the human heart. Secondly, sinful indulgence when it's saturated by sin. Then thirdly, the futility of thinking one can escape judgment who mocks God and his greatest crime is contempt for God's grace and his word. With those three points to uh, think about and to direct us as we look into this <clears throat> a passage of verse 12, which I've already entitled, The Folly of Mocking God. Notice it says in uh, uh, 12, uh, the latter part of the verse, The Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil or bring calamity. What they were doing there was denying the moral government of God. As though God the Creator uh, laid aside or stepped aside into some celestial haven and left man to himself. No, indeed. God established a moral government right from the beginning. Man may try to deny his accountability to God, but God, through the record of Holy Scripture, has shown the folly of mocking God. And you mock God when you despise what he says. In Psalm 97 too, David said that um, righteousness and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Not only did they deny the moral government of God by this phrase, but they denied judgment day. And that's what man doesn't like to look upon. He tried to, man tries to deny that, who has never come to peace with God. He tries to deny judgment day. But listen to what David again said in Psalm 96, 13. The Lord cometh. He cometh to judge the world in righteousness and he cometh to judge the people by his truth. And you might as well know that on judgment day, and it will come, it is the word of God that he will use to judge us. He is the judge and he will use his word to judge us. And then thirdly, by denying the moral government of God by this phrase and denying that God has judged, what they're really doing was they were making a mockery of his word. And really, that's what churches do today. Man makes a mockery of his word. And this was the Old Testament church. And many churches today, they, oh, they praise God and they have their worship services but they will not be submissive to the authority of God in the way to run the church that he said he would build and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And so, <clears throat> but when we think about it, it's always been that way. Back in Genesis 19.14, before God rained fire and brimstone upon Sodom, 
Lot went out to warn his sons-in-law. And what was their reaction to him as he brought word, it was the word of the Lord that he had gotten from the angels that um, Sodom would be destroyed. They mocked. <laughs> they looked upon him as one that was out of his mind. But that's the way man is today. And then, <clears throat> in, um, and by the way, in Jude 7, speaking about the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, when fire and brimstone were rained upon it for going after strange flesh and fornication, and that strange flesh, you might as well know, has to do with homosexuality. Listen to what Jude says concerning this judgment. He says that Sodom and Gomorrah were an example of those suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And that's something that ought to sober the heart of one who would mock the word of God. And then Exodus 5, 2, when um, Moses was sent to uh, deliver his people out of bondage, out of uh, slavery to Pharaoh and the taskmasters, uh, when uh, Moses said, let my people go, um, Pharaoh responded, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? And that's the same spirit that encompasses this nation today and even in the church. Who is the Lord that we should obey his voice? Well, be not deceived. God is not mocked. One day the knee will bow. One day the tongue will confess. And then it will be too late that everything God said is true. And then in Job 21, 14, we have these words. Therefore, they the wicked say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. That is ever the inveterate hatred of God's way, which is the way of righteousness. And then <clears throat> we also find in the Old Testament church, Second Chronicles 30.10, they had not observed the Passover, the holiest day of all, uh, for Israel, which was to commemorate their being delivered out of bondage from Egypt. Uh, they had not observed the Passover for many years. And so Hezekiah set aside a time. He was a godly king. And he sent messengers, and they called them popes in those days, uh, to uh, Ephraim, to Manasseh, to Zebulun, there to uh, the tribes in the north. And when they made this announcement, what did they do? The people do. They mocked. They scorned about being involved in such a, a holy observance of God who had sown such, such grace to them in delivering them out of bondage when they were in slaves for so many years. And then again in Second Chronicles 36, 16, right before um, Israel would be sent into captivity, the king at the time was Zedekiah. And God sent messengers to warn the king and the princes and the prophets that judgment was coming. You know what they did? They mocked the prophets and they despised what they said. But they paid. The, they uh, they were deceived. But God will not be mocked. And they went into judgment. They went into captivity. And so when man feels that way about the word of God, then they mock at sin. Proverbs fourteen nine. What does that mean? In other words, they think light of it. They pay no attention to it. And boy, that is the spirit that in, has engulfed our nation today and in some measure the church. Man makes a mock. They scorn. They think little of sin. But let me tell you something, dear ones. And sin is lawlessness against God the Creator. Sin is criminal acts against God the Creator. Now, uh, as we think about um, these uh, um, different scripture references to illustrate or to emphasize the spirit of what um, Judah did and let me repeat it again it says they say in their heart the Lord will not do good nor will he do evil or bring judgment bring calamity but I'm reminded of the New Testament you know they mocked the Lord Jesus Luke 23 11 it tells us that when he went to go before uh, on trial before Herod it says the, his men of war mocked him and then in uh, the same uh, book, Luke 23, verses uh, 35 and 36, first, the chief priests and the religious people mocked him. They said, if you're the Christ, come down from the cross, save yourself. They were blinded by hatred. They were blinded because Jesus was a threat to their religious power. If he would have come down, there would have been no salvation for sinners. He had to die on the cross to become a curse for us, to redeem us from the curse of the law, for we're all lawless. And then <clears throat> we find not only did they mock him, but then they mocked the resurrection. Paul preaching in Athens, 
and there on top of Mars Hill, as he preached about the resurrection, they mocked him. Some, some did believe. And those, his people are mocked too. That's no strange thing. It's always been that way down through the 2,000 year history of the church. They who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and his word many times are mocked. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 11.36. Some of God's people had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment and martyrdom. It's always been that way. But God will deliver his people, even though he allows them to suffer or to be tested and tried. He will deliver his people. For you see, God's, <clears throat> when he planned this universe, he planned it. To, uh, he knows all, he's the architect of it. He knows what the end is. The new heaven and the new earth after this earth will be destroyed by fire at judgment day. And then we find too that um, uh, his return is mocked as we find in Second Peter chapter 3 verses 3 and 4. They scorned about the Lord coming back again. Well, man can mock the word of God Man can scoff and mock about sin which is against God. Man can even scoff and mock God himself. Be not deceived. God will not be mocked. There is a judgment to come. And then secondly, notice it says here in verse 12, it says, I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees. And I've called that sinful indulgence. That means to be saturated by sin. And to get an understanding of that, the lees, <clears throat> uh, take a bottle of wine. In time, the sediment uh, will, and the dregs will settle to the bottom of the bottle of wine. And so it's called to settle on its lees. This is a reference to wine settling on its dregs or settling on its sediment. What had happened is Israel had settled so long on its sinful conduct that it had saturated them. It had, they were anchored on sin and sin controlled them. So what happens uh, when uh, uh, people get anchored, the anchor their soul upon sinful conduct and behavior, a sinful spirit? They detach themselves from the fear of God. They no longer have any fear of God. Listen to what it says in Proverbs 1, 29, 30. Here it was addressed to the rebellious young men. They hated knowledge. They did not choose the fear of the Lord. And they would have none of the Lord's counsel. And they despised all his reproof. And so that is what happens when the soul is anchored upon sin. No fear of God. And then there is a false sense of security. The word settled there. And we see that in verse 18. They were settled upon their silver and gold, thinking that would deliver them from the Lord's wrath. They had a false sense of security. We find in verse 6a, <clears throat> and then in verse 9, that uh, their God was their belly. And the, the New Testament church, we find there at Philippi, that there were some whose uh, God was their belly, and their glory was their shame. Nothing new under the sun as far as man's wicked and sinful and arrogant heart toward the Lord in his unconverted state. And then also we find in uh, verse 6 and 8 and 9 and 13, they were intoxicated by pleasure and the sensuality and the magnifying of things. That those things there, and some of you, Maybe there's some sin in your life that you love so much that you will not give it up. On one hand, you're praising God or maybe go to worship service. On the other hand, you're holding to that sin. You've settled like wine settles on its dregs, on, on its sediment. So has your soul and your flesh settled and anchored itself upon some sinful conduct that's keeping you in captivity. Well, God says, I'll punish that doesn't mean that when we're saved, we're perfect, but it does mean that no soul that's ever been saved can continue in sin. His soul and heart is grieved when he does sin and offend the one who has shown such mercy on him. And as we think of those two things now, uh, the, um, uh, let me repeat again the first point that I made regarding the folly of mocking God is arrogance and contempt of the human heart. And secondly, uh, that... The soul that's anchored upon sin um, continues in its sinful 
self-indulgence and become saturated by sin. If there ever was a society saturated by sin and sinful indulgence and arrogance to the authority of God, it's in the day in which we live. Again, thirdly, the futility of thinking one can escape judgment who mocks God. And as I said, the greatest crime is contempt for the grace of God shown in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me repeat this again. Verse 12, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their leaves. We just talked about that regarding the soul that's anchored upon sinful conduct. But now I want to talk about the futility of thinking one can escape judgment. You see, when God uses the language he says <clears throat> that I will take, um, uh, I will search Jerusalem with candles. At that day, they had no electricity. So to examine every corner of the house, they would use candles. But God also refers to his commandment as a lamp and his law as a light. So what he is saying here is the criminal heart and the criminal record will be exposed. He was speaking out about Judah He's speaking about you, that about you, and he's speaking that about me. Our criminal heart and our criminal record will be exposed on Judgment Day. And secondly, notice about the thoroughness of God's search. He says, I will um, search Jerusalem. Now when God searches the heart, he does so with his word. I already said, thy commandment is a lamp, thy law is light, the entrance of thy word giveth light. The word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And it's like a mirror that searches and probes and nothing is hid from the all-searching eye of God. You remember earlier I said that God will judge the world. The Lord Jesus will judge the world by his truth. And so his truth will be measured against all of our acts on Judgment Day, if we have not found refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. How terrible that would be. Oh, we might have our heart lifted up and gloat in our sin. But what we're really doing is mocking God, the Creator, and His moral government, and the throne that He sits on as judge over all, sovereign over all. Yes, as I said earlier about Ecclesiastes 8.11, no, He doesn't execute a sentence immediately against evil work. But everything about our lives, our thoughts, our words, our deed, are all recorded in his eternal book. And don't think we'll escape, for every one of those crimes against him will be paid for unless we have found refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to save us from our sins. And then, again, um, As I already said, God will use his word to judge. And then notice, there will be no escape from judgment. Let me read verses 10 and 11. And shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that there shall be the noise of a cry from the fish gate, and an howling from the second, and a great crashing from the hills. Howl, ye inhabitants of Maktesh, uh, a place there in Jerusalem for the merchants, for all the merchant people are cut down. And all they that bear silver are cut off. In other words, that language is used to show that there will be no place in Jerusalem to escape the judgment. That God will vent upon his people through his instrument, the the king of Babylon and his army. Now, he's not speaking just about an historical happening then. He's speaking about what will happen on Judgment Day. Everything will be exposed and none will escape. None will escape judgment who has not repented of sin and come to faith in Jesus Christ, trusting Him alone for salvation. And so there will be no escape. Now I'd like to just, in closing, I'd like to show about the people of Judah and what will happen to those, the unconverted heart that I spoke in the beginning that mocked God. Listen to verses uh, 13. 
Therefore their goods shall become a booty, and their houses a desolation. It goes on to speak about their uh, vineyards and everything else that they delighted in. But you see, on Judgment Day, all that's dear to the heart will be gone. Let me repeat that. All that's dear to the heart, the unconverted heart, will be gone. Secondly, in verses um, 14 and 15, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man, shall cry uh, there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress. And so, their mockings now is turned to terror. And that will be the same for you, my unsaved friend. That if you mock God, as I have described in this message today, as we saw by the Old Testament Church of Judah, you may mock now, but your mocking will be turned to terror in that day. And then thirdly, in verses 17 and 18, it says, I will bring distress. Or in verse 16, <clears throat> um, he speaks here about the futility of false security. He speaks about their fenced cities and their high towers. It won't do them any good in the day of judgment. And if you found security in your bankroll or whatever, your castle or whatever, whatever you might find some kind of security in, let's hear what it says in verse 18. Silver and gold will not deliver in the day of the Lord's wrath. But now uh, I have two, and now as we spoke about the rea reality of God's wrath, now let's look at chapter 2, verse 3. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the days of the Lord's anger. And that's why I plead with sinners to find a refuge in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 17 we read these words. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee. He is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Just this thought in closing. We can mock God. We can despise his word. We can go on our sinful way. Rebellious way. But there's nothing left but judgment. But if we turn and repent. And turn to the Lord. In repentance and faith. There is safety. There is forgiveness. There is fellowship, relationship with the God of all creation through time and through eternity. God bless you until we meet again. And I